Valkaria, the people of the town, and we'll get into what scholars say that that means. And that the meaning behind this is, is so that, that first and foremost is that those among the Prophet who denied the message, and by extension, all of those who deny that any prophetic message can take heed, that they can hopefully learn a lesson from the, those that came before them and what happened to them. And as the principle states, if we do not learn to take lessons from the people of the past, is that we will be lessons for people of the future. If we do not take lessons from people of the past, we become the lesson for the people of the future. Because it will fall into the same thing. And that this is why it's so important for us to learn lessons and to that go beyond the surface level of how we understand that human acts to understand the purpose behind them, which relates to ultimately the decisions that you and I make. And human beings are very subtle. And the way that we come to the conclusions that we make, the way that we make the decisions that we make is very subtle. And it requires an intimate knowledge of the states of our heart, an intimate knowledge of what is taking place there, and that why it is that we do what we do, and how does desire play its part, and how does shaitan play its part, and how does that relate to our temperament and all of these different things and our particular situation that we're in and those that are around us and the ways, way that we are raised as children and so forth and so on. That this plays out with different people in different ways. But the key is, is that we come to know ourselves. And some of those characteristics we share with all human beings and some of those are unique to ourselves. But we hope as we go through life is that we make the right decisions. And Allah Ta'ala gives us tawfiq to be able to that do sincerely for His sake what is pleasing to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to avoid all the different ways of going astray, the two greatest archetypes of which are to not know and thus go astray without knowledge, or to know, but to have our desires get the best of us, and so that we go astray based upon knowledge. And that, that latter state is more dangerous than the former. So Allah Ta'ala says in verse 13, وَاضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَرِيَةِ إِذْ جَاءَهَا الْمُرْسَلُونَ And set forth for them as a parable, an example, and a, le a lesson, a similitude. The people of the town, when the, messenger, when the message bearers, or you could say the messengers, came unto it. And so here is that the Prophet ﷺ is commanded to provide the Quraysh with an example of what happened to those that came before them when they denied the messengers that came with truth. And so that this is why Wadlarib and set forth for them is first and foremost a khitab, Allah Ta'ala is addressing Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, and by extension Allah is addressing that all people who are that carrying out the prophetic message and that representing him وسلم, as his inheritor to the people that they are speaking to. And so that, that this is first and foremost a, an address of the Prophet and by extension all of those that are carrying out the prophetic duty after him. And set forth for them. Lahum for them here refers to the again the Mushriki of the Quraysh the polytheists of the Quraysh whom that, um, that were around him and that were described earlier as those whom that were denying the message. And a method in the Arabic language, actually before we get into method, sorry, I want to look a little bit at this word, that wadrib. Darba yadribu is normally the word that we use for hitting someone. But the foundational meaning of darb is that where that you take two things and you bring them together and such that they strike one another and then an impact is left. So that's really what is meant by darb. And obviously you can think about when you hit someone, that that's what happens. That there's forces used, is that you have, for instance, your fist then impacting, touching that someone else's body and then that some type of impact. So this is the foundational meaning of darb, and it is for this reason that it is used in different contexts as well. For instance, 
is that we also speak of it in the context of traveling. And that if you say that, that the reason that it relates to traveling is because is that, that when the traveler that walks upon the earth or treads the earth or his riding beast that he is riding upon treads the earth, يَضْرِبْ رِجْلَيْهِ بِرِجْلَيْهِ الْأَرْضِ is that he is in a sense hitting the ground that, or with his feet if he's walking or with the uh, legs of the animal, the hooves of the animal that he is riding. And then that there's imprints that are left. When you walk that there's footprints in wind that you ride that on some type of riding beast that footprints are left in the earth or in the sand or whatever. It's also a word that we use for printing coins. As you say, darba fulanun ad darahim. Is it so and so printed that here in this sense silver coins or even gold coins? And the idea behind that is is that you that are taking that coin that you want it to look like, and you are pressing them. So it is, but the, it, you are pressing the molds, and then you are forming new coins. And this is why that when we use this word with a method, which here we roughly translate as parable, is that well, little bit of home method in, and so that you that setting forth a parable, what are you trying to do? Is that you are trying to impress? A lesson upon someone. So in all of these all of these meanings is that there's this idea of contact and then an impression. Whether it's physically hitting or whether it's traveling and the traces that you leave behind, whether it's that printing coins and pressing coins. And the idea behind Methaden is that you have a parable, a lesson, a similitude that you want to impress upon someone. And that's the whole point of this, is not that we just hear the story is that the meaning is impressed upon us and imprinted in us so that in our own lives is that we can see how that the archetype manifests in our own sense in relation to how we respond to it. So a well, little bit of home method in. A method is a parable. And a parable in English is it's a story that is used to illustrate that some type of lesson. It's a parable. If we that translate it as similitude, a similitude is really closer to the foundational meaning of method, which is this idea of com a comparison between two things. And you compare one thing to another. In this sense, what is being compared is that the state of these people who, as we will see, denied the, the messenger bear, the message bearers that came to them, is that is the same state of these people who that denied the Prophet So there is a similarity there. Or you could just roughly refer to it as an example, which is that something specific that indicates a general rule. Anyhow, and set forth for them as a parable Ashab al Qariya, the people of the town. And uh, the vast majority of scholars say that the town that is referred to here in Arabic is Antakya, in English Antioch. And um, that when they say, when Allah says, al-Mursalun, when the message bearers came unto it, here is where they, they differ. Um, that are these message bearers apostles that were sent to the town by Sayyidina Isa, by the Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam. And that this is that one opinion of the commentators is that it was the city is Antioch and it was a that town in which there were polytheists and that Allah Ta'ala commanded the Prophet Jesus السلام, to send to that of his apostles there to convey the message and to call them to Islam. Um, according to another opinion, uh, the here the Mursalun the message bearers or the messengers, they're prophets. And um, some of the scholars say this seems to be more likely because our prophet himself is that referred to as that one of the mursaleen, as we spoke about in the third verse, in the kalamin mursaleen. Truly you are one of the messengers. So there's a difference of opinion. The point is, is not the historical details. The point is, is that the lesson that comes from it. Okay, and so that, again, that our Prophet is being commanded to let tell them, set forth for them a parable. And it is the story of the Ashab al Qarya. Because in the Quran, it's left general, means the, the people of the town. 
and so that that those that are in his time can understand what happens to people when they deny prophetic truth. And then Allah Ta'ala says in verse 14, إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثٍ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ When we sent to them two, they denied them, so we reinforced them with a third. And they said, Verily, we have been sent to you. And so that if we base it on the fact that it was, uh, if, we look, if we say that it was the Prophet Jesus who sent the apostles, the, or that they were either way, is that that two of the messengers, either the apostles or the messengers, that came to this town. And the first response of the people of this town was that they denied their message that they brought. And then Allah Ta'ala says, فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثًا So we reinforced them with a third. And then a, a third messenger came and that reinforced everything it is that the first two said and that encourage them to that, uh, move away from their polytheism and to worship Allah Ta'ala only and associate no partners to Him and to leave their worshiping of idols. And that the way that they spoke is that inna ilaykum mursaloon is that they wanted to emphasize what it is that they had been commanded to tell them that indeed that they were messengers that indeed verily we have been sent unto you and there are that two mu'akkidat here. There are two that functions in the Arabic language that are used to that emphasize this sentence. The first is enna, and the second is, in this case, the jumla ismiya, the nominal sentence. And scholars also point out is that the wisdom of that if we say that it was the Prophet Jesus sending that two people, and um, how that one of them could support the other and that, that one testimony is not the same as two and having two people that speak and it is more convincing uh, that for the people that they are speaking to and then that they said in response to these message bearers coming to them and this is verse 15 قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشْرُ مِثْلُنَا وَمَا أَنْزَرُ الرَّحْمَنُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَكْذِبُونَ they said, you are but human beings like us. And the All-Merciful has not sent down anything. You are simply lying. So this was their first response. In other words, is that the people of the town responded to these three messengers in this particular way. And what they said includes three things. There is, first of all, what is called the i'tirad. That is, is that they are denying or they are opposing the message. And then secondly, is that there is um, ittiham, or iftira, that they are uh, that lying. And then there is the ittiham, and that they are then blaming um, them, or they are that finding, um, that putting into question what it is that they are saying. And so that one of the other meanings that we take from this is as well is that this is again, this is the nature of that truth when someone comes with it is that there will be people who are opposed to it and Allah Ta'ala continuously mentions stories like this in the Quran to us so this can be firmly ruled within ourselves and so that we shouldn't that be amazed at people that opposing that religious truth this is not something that should shock us. This is something that, in fact, is expected. Now, when it comes to, as often is the case in our time, when people are misrepresenting <coughs> the religion itself, that's something else entirely. And that's something that has to be dealt with, which is one of the problems of our time. But when it comes to people who are really embodying the principles of the religion, it's to be expected is that they are going to be seen as strangers. Lest we forget the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu is that Islam began as something strange. Bada ad-deen gharibaan wa si'udu gharibaan kama bada and it will return strange as it began fa-tawba lil ghuraba so God tidings to the strangers. So if you feel estranged 
in your particular locale, in your community, wherever it is that you are from, because they're not like-minded people, because that you are struggling to maintain your deen and you find that people around you are not going through the same struggle, is that we should go back to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and that we should actually be happy and see this as a blessing of Allah, that we are finding that difficulty because our Prophet said, glad tidings, فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَى God tidings to those who are strangers, who feel estranged. And that, in general, this is also how we are taught to live here in this world. Kun fid dunya ka'annaka gharibun aw abidu sabil. Be in this world as if you are a gharib, a stranger, or an abir sabil, someone who's just passing by, a wayfarer. So, the world in and of itself even if you didn't have a lot of Islamophobia, for instance, or a lot of people that hated you, or whatever else it is, is that the world itself is like this. Is that if we feel excessively comfortable in the world, it's a sign that there is a lack of Iman. Because a believer that should feel more comfortable in his or her reflection of the world to come, and that we need to work on ourselves to slowly detach over time, putting things in their proper place while we're here, of course, but working with a strong intention and having the motivating factor behind everything that we do to be, to draw near to Allah Ta'ala and to return to Him safely, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so, is that the first part of this, what do they say? قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشُرُونَ مِثْلُنَا Their first response is to say, is that you are but human beings like us. And that if you really look carefully at this, this is one of the that main things that people can't get over. Is that the fact that there are messengers. And sometimes a lot of people throughout history, and even in our time, find it far-fetched and difficult to believe that a human being like them will that be a be able to receive what we are calling prophecy and to that receive this message from Allah Jalla Jalalu and to convey that and we must follow them. And unfortunately is that there are many Muslims today that are finding difficulty in understanding this. And that this is a very, very dangerous situation. Because yes, that our Prophet was a human being. No one is saying that he wasn't Bashar. The Bishra in Arabic is your skin. Bashar is a human being. And we, Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Say that I am a human being. I am a Bashar like you. مِثْلُكُمْ I'm a, I'm a human being like you. But then what does the verse say? يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ I receive revelation. إِنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهٌ وَاحِدٌ and indeed that your Lord is one. And so is that while we absolutely affirm that our Prophet was a human being, وسلم, and there was a wisdom in that, so that we could follow him. Because the fact that he was a human being is that it enables us to that feel that sense of closeness to us, even though he wasn't like other human beings. And what we mean by he wasn't like other human beings is that he receives revelation which is this right after that in the same verse. So he's different from other human beings insofar as he receives revelation. And we spoke a little bit yesterday about the difficulty of him bearing revelation and how it is only prophets and messengers that have the ability to bear revelation and were anyone else in creation that who is not prepared to receive it that to have to receive revelation, which they can't obviously, but let's just say, Naftarad, were they to have, is that they would have been completely, that just completely and totally annihilated from the power of revelation. Just as we mentioned yesterday, that Lo the Quran ala Jabal, this is what would happen to that a mountain. And so is that Allah Ta'ala has chosen prophets and messengers to be able to bear, receive, and transmit revelation, and that this opens up a door for us to understand a very subtle point. How do we view Allah Ta'ala's creation? 
and for it really is simple at one level and then to the degree that someone doesn't have that clarity is that there are that various diversions whereby which the heart and mind becomes muddled and it becomes difficult for people to decipher what it is that they should really believe and what it is that they shouldn't believe whereas if you just confirm the existence of Allah once you believe in the existence of Allah and you believe that Allah Ta'ala is all-powerful and you believe that he's fa'alima yurid and does whatever he wants so many other things become so easy to believe miracles are easy to believe once you believe in Allah that believing that Allah that gave revelation right to a, a, a human being is easy to believe once you affirm the existence of Allah all of that is easy to believe. And one of the common questions that you're asked, especially with young people, what does Islam say about evolution and so forth and so on? And questions of this nature, natural selection and that Darwinism. And while I'm in agreement that we need to have very um, that sophisticated responses to uh, various obfuscations, this being one of them, and I'm all for doing the research for these things and writing books to clarify these points. From one perspective, once you realize and believe that Allah Jalla Jalalu is all powerful and does whatever He wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very easy for you to believe in the unique creation of Adam alayhi salam. It's really simple as that. And so what ends up happening is a lot of people that when they entertain these questions, they're entertaining them from a standpoint of weak belief. And that this is the modernist Muslim tendency, where you have to go back now and rewrite some of our history, or much of our history. Because it's hard for you, no wait, the late Isa Mi'raj? No, no, it was just a dream. Okay, or is that, um, that miracles aren't really miracles, there's some type of scientific explanation for it. None of that is necessary once you believe in the existence of Allah. You realize is that everything in creation belongs to Him. And in reality, is that this is why we call a miracle is a breaking of the norm. Even the norm actually is really a miracle if you think about it. The very fact that we are experiencing existence like this, in, with this fluidity, and we are experiencing time right now as we speak, from one moment to the next and we don't feel it as being choppy we don't feel ourselves going into existence and out of existence Allah Ta'ala is creating all of this in every single moment right now as we are speaking am I, as I'm speaking it is something really amazing and that he has his sunan in creation so that we know gravity being one of them that you hold something up generally speaking that it's going to drop but these what we call norms it's only because Allah Ta'ala is creating that and sustaining that in every single moment that it is happening. So a breaking of the norm really is in relation to how we see things. Otherwise Allah Ta'ala could have made things differently. But this is the way that we experience things. And it's really fascinating to think about that, that everything that is happening in creation, right now, as we speak, not just in this world, but in the micro world and in the macro world, is that Allah Ta'ala is the Qayyum of Samawati wal Ard, and we say in Surah and Ayat Kursi, La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. He does not doze off, nor does he sleep. And that just as you and I, were we to doze off, we lose our qudra, we lose our power. And they actually mention this in the books of fiqh as a way of determining whether or not you fell asleep because there's certain legal rulings that relate to your wudu if you fall asleep. And if you're holding a pen and the pen falls out of your hand, is that, that's a sign, for instance, that you had fallen asleep. And what is the meaning there is that you lose your power. You fall asleep, but you, your normal power you have, you no longer have. Were Allah Ta'ala to doze off, and it is impossible for Him to doze off because He is the Hayyul Qayyum, is that everything in, un in the universe would be obliterated. He is sustaining everything in every single moment and created and recreating it subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the way that we experience it is that it's seamless. 
But the reality is, is that were it not to be that Allah Ta'ala is giving us the ability to live in every moment and to do what it is that we do in every moment, none of this would ever be here. Anyhow, is that once you establish that, it's very easy for you to believe that Allah Ta'ala sent a messenger. But a lot of people get veiled on this particular point. And at the level of disbelief and refusing to accept a message that comes from that a messenger. And then for other people that even though they might be believers and accept the idea of a messenger, is that they de-emphasize the special nature of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And that is also a great danger. Other examples of that previous people's denying that the Prophets, because of their human side, in Surah Al-Taghaban, And thus it was that their messengers used to come them, to them with that clarifying matters. And they would say that, will a human being be a source of guidance for us? Will a human being guide us? In other words, that they were in the state of ta'ajjub, a state of negative type of wonder that led them to deny. And then in Surah Al-Furqan, And they said, that what is with this messenger? Is that he eats food and he walks in the marketplace. Is that were there not to have been that a angel that have been that uh, descended with him and that could then warn others alongside of him. So in other words, is that this is nothing new, that people have been blinded by the human side of the messengers from the earliest of times. And that this, again, that gets back to something very fundamental, is how do we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation? And everything in creation, from the standpoint that Allah wa ta'ala created it, has a meaning. And we've quoted this line of poetry many times, but it's such an amazing line of poetry that it deserves to be quoted time and time again, and it definitely pertains to this subject, where that Sheikh Muhammad ibn Habib said, <laughs> Indeed, that the entire universe is meanings that set up and forms. Anyone and everyone who perceives this is from the people of recollection, is from the true people of intellect. In other words, all of creation is meanings. But it's whether or not that we can pick up on that meaning or not. And so people that just look at creation as creation, there's nothing beyond the material, is that those same people will be blinded to that learning the special nature of something, something that Allah Ta'ala put in that thing, whether it's a wisdom or whether it relates to a prophet or messenger, that something special he's given them, i.e. made them a prophet or messenger to bear revelation and then convey it. And so it really gets back to that our belief in Allah. And once you establish that, is that all of these other things actually become very easy for us to reconcile. So, مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشَلُوا مِثْلُنَا You are but human beings like us. And the second part of this are Muslims that really de-emphasize the importance of the Prophet Muhammad and almost think of him in a very vague, that very that, um, uh, distant type way that somehow his only job was to come and to convey the message and that's it. There's no connection that you really have to him after that other than to the message, not the message bearer. And this is just simply not the understanding of the companions or that all of the people who came after them, the rightly guided scholars had this until this day. If that was the case, why did Sayyidina Bilal that have to leave Medina al Munawwara after the time of the Prophet? There was so much nostalgia in Medina that there was so much that reminded him of the Prophet. He couldn't bear being there. And then at the very end of his life, just before he passes, is that he is the one that said that when that his wife realized that he was going to pass soon, and that she said, Wa karba, what a difficult situation this is. And he changed the frame. 
And he said, what taraba? He says, what an exhilarating situation this is. Ghadan alqa al-muhibba, Muhammadin wa Tomorrow I'm going to meet my loved ones, Muhammad and his companions. In other words, why was that what he was saying at the end of his life? Why was the only thing? Yes, he believed in Allah. Yes, he wanted to meet Allah. But why was it the Prophet said him and his companions? And why was it that not only a mentioning of Allah? Because he saw being with the Prophet and being with the Prophet's companions as the means for him to receive the bliss of paradise. And that's not only not that does not contravene any of the principles of Tawheed that we believe in. And this is from the essence of Tawheed. Everything that Allah Ta'ala created is created in His creation ultimately. That is a means for us, if we approach it the right way, to draw near to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you could go on and on and on and on and on. Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan, that the night before that he was murdered, he saw a dream with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi saying to him, is that tomorrow you're going to break your fast with me. Sayyidina Hussein bin Ali saw something similar. That, and so forth and so on. There's a number of examples like this throughout history where is that it shows the connection of people to the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is one of the, not only important, this is one of the most important that aspects of our deen. And that this modern coarseness that many modern Muslims have in relation to the Prophet and that almost as if that they don't want to send sarawat upon him. I mean, even there's so many proofs of this that this is a topic in and of itself, but I just wanted to point out that even though Muslims believe in the Prophet of the Prophet, still is it sometimes that his special nature is de emphasized and that. What we want is a balance in the middle. We believe that the Prophet was a human being, but we believe he received revelation, sallallahu alayhi wa Ultimately, this is about being sincere and worshipping Allah, but the way that we do that is through the prophetic teachings. And then the more that you love the Prophet, the more that you're going to follow him, and then the more that you follow him, the more that then you will attain the love of Allah Jalla Jalla. So the point is, is that traditional Muslims have always understood a balanced way to understand this, in this context, Allah Ta'ala is speaking of how people are blinded from the Prophet ﷺ or from a Prophet or a Messenger by virtue of their humanity and just being in the state of wondering, how could another human being that guide me? And sometimes that could just merely be from that a lack of understanding of Tawheed, of belief in the Divine Unity, and sometimes that could come from arrogance that is in the heart. And so that in our day and age is that we have to understand, and I'll speak specifically in the context of the United States of America, we live in a highly racialized society. And if you would go and ask the vast majority of people in America, what is their opinion of the Middle East? Mention adjectives to describe the particular, the, the, in your mind, the typical Middle Easterner. And you'd be surprised, actually you probably wouldn't be surprised, that what people would say. Now, but knowing that our Prophet is from the Middle East, and he's from the Arabian Peninsula, and even people earlier in history, is that in the two great empires of the time, the Byzantine and the Persian Empire, is that they completely disregarded the Arab. That they, had, they held the Arab in very low regard. But this is because of their arrogance. Is that if Allah Ta'ala sends a messenger, is that if we are truth seekers, we would accept that message from anyone, who, whoever that person might be. And what I'm pointing out here is, is that if people have arrogance, if they disregard people, or if they look down upon people, and they belittle people, do you really think that they're going to accept guidance from that person? Do you really think they're going to accept guidance from that person? And it's on the tip of many people's tongues even to this day. Although that people now will that get in big trouble if they actually say it. And then even within the United States of America, when that people look at other converts and certain types of converts, one of the things that you'll hear people say is that I'm not in need of changing things. I'm very happy with the way that I am. But a lot of what it really is subtly, it's like, hmm, these are the people that are converting, but I don't really want to be with them 
because I'm of a certain class or I'm of a that certain social dis level of social distinction. These will blind us from the truth, these types of things. And um, that again, it gets back to the humanity of someone being blinded by their humanity. And one of the beautiful du'as of Shaykh Abu Bakr bin Salim is, Allahumma atbi anni bashariyat kulli muslim wa ashidni khususiyat kulli muslim. Or kama qal, he asked Allah to that veil from him the human side of all believers and to show him the special nature of all believers. All believers have something special. Everyone. Everyone in this room, everyone in this community, everyone in this area, all Muslims that you meet will have something special about them. But if you're arrogant and you don't think that there's anything special about them, you're not going to benefit from them. You're not going to be able to that take what it is that they have and to benefit from them. So this is the first thing and this is really deep. There's so many things that could be said about this. This is very deep psychology that has prevented so many people and to this day there are people that it's just too far-fetched for them to believe that a human being received revelation, the idea of a prophet or a messenger. And as long as they're caught up on that, is that it would, it's very difficult for them to accept the truth that they bring because they see themselves as human beings just like them. And rather in our time is that what is prevalent now in our time is that anything of the past is considered to be that looked down upon. For the most part with this myth of progress is that anything of the past is like like 1400 years ago you're following someone who lived 1400 years ago? We live in the age of you know space exploration. We live in the age of that nanotechnology. We live in the age of that all of these types of things that are happening. That you're following someone 1400 years ago? And you'd be surprised. The vast majority of people who are part of this globalized modern world and that are that inundated with much of its nonsense, this is their perspective. Yes, we are following a prophet who lived 1400 years ago, and not only are we following a prophet who lived 1400 years ago, Khayr al Qurun Qarni. It was the very best time of all. The best of all centuries, the best of all ages was my age. And this is why, if you really think about it, there is so much that about our deen, it's just diametrically opposed to what we're being told in the modern world. It doesn't mean that we can't exist in the modern world. We can. We're a part of the modern world. There's nothing, there's no other way, there's not really a way not to be a part of the modern world. We are a part of the modern world, but we are holding on to something much different. And that this is why it's so important for us, it's so important for us to have izza. We have to have izza of Islam. And the reality of izza is that we feel at the level of our heart is that we've been given the greatest gift of all. We have been given the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah in submitting to the Lord of the heavens and the earth in a time where you have some of the most arrogant people who have ever walked the face of this earth, who actually think in their mind, erroneously of course, that they can do things better than Allah Jalla Jalla. And yes, that we are maintaining our principles in light of all of that. That yes, we even wear traditional dress. If pe when people outside see a woman with a hijab on, they see a man covering his head or wearing a turban or something like this, or wearing traditional clothing, it, they don't know how to process that in their mind. Although there still are religious communities that even here in the United States that dress traditionally. They, there are. But for the most part, the public sphere is not a place that is warm to religion. And all of these meanings are circling around this same archetype that started that a long time ago and has been further compounded in the time in which we live and has become more nuanced. Anyhow, this is the first thing. You are but human beings like us. And so this is the iftira. This is where they lied and they said, and the All-Merciful has not revealed anything. And so notice here, 
is that they acknowledged, these particular people, the belief in that Allah Jalla Jalla because they referred to him as Ar-Rahman. But they're denying that he sent down revelation. And again, if you take it back to that blessed story, which has so many different meanings packed into it, of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And when he was asked if he believed that the Prophet went to Jerusalem by night and came back and ascended into the heavens, and he said his famous statement, if he said it, it is true. And because then he said, I believe he that receives something greater than that, which is revelation from Allah. And that is the amazing thing about belief, is that if Allah places belief in your heart, He makes it easy for you to accept that Allah Ta'ala gives revelation to certain prophets and messengers. And it is easy to accept, because Allah Jalla Jalla does whatever He wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If He wanted to, He could have left us to our intellects and said, work it out. You're not getting sent a messenger. Work it out yourself. I gave you an intellect, an intellect that even though definitively it can't, according to the Shahid Ashari position, is that tell you what uh, that uh, good and bad is, khair and shar is, is that by virtue of the fitrah, we tend to incline towards knowing what is good and what is that not good. Allah Ta'ala could have done that, <coughs> but He didn't. So, the second thing is, is that they denied that the sending down of revelation, and then is that they started to criticize the character. So at first they're like, you know, who are you? You're just a human being like us. And then second is that they then deny that they had this special, they, they were sent something special, which is revelation. And then they started to criticize their character, right? In and to illa takthibu. You are simply lying. And if you would look at these three principles and apply it to many people's responses, these are the things that you will see happening. Mm -hmm. And then especially this last one, there's a long list of things that people end up saying about you. You're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, a long list of things. So, in antum illa taktibun, that you are that simply lying. And then that their response to this was, qalu. رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ نَمُرْسَلُونَ So keep in mind that they just said, um, that they just said to them, is that they were, that they, that they were sent to them. إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Excuse me, they just said to them in that, uh, that uh, verse 14, إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Yes. And then in verse 16, is that قَالُوا رَبَّنَا يَعْلَمُوا إِنَّ إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ So it's very close, but there's a slight difference. At first they said to them, إِنَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Verily we have been sent to you. And we use verily here, even though it is an archaic word, because there is emphasis in the Arabic expression. إِنَّ right? So inna is one of the ways that we emphasize something in Arabic. So if I say, that Munir is present with us. And someone thinks that Munir is actually not really here. So I say, Munir haldirun ma'na. But then if someone thinks that that's not the case, I can further emphasize that by saying, Inna Munirun haldirun ma'na. I emphasize that Munir is definitely with us, or verily he's with us. And then that if I want to even emphasize that further, I can say, Inna munirun la haldirun ma'na. I can add a lamb before haldir. And that gives further emphasis. And so that as there was two ways of emphasizing when they first said that we're messengers, because they wanted to get the point across, now in verse 16 is that there's four ways of emphasizing it. The same two and then two more. The first is where they say, Rabbuna ya'lamu, that our Lord knows. Which is emphasizing the point further. Inna ilaykum la. This is known as the lam and muzahlaqa la mursanun. Our Lord knows that we have indeed been sent unto you. And so this is the way that they responded to them. And that when you have people that deny, 
is that there's only two things you can do. And this is why their response was of twofold. Was to reiterate what it is that they came with in the first place. And part of this is the rhetorical value of a lot of people, when people question what it is that they're saying, will all of a sudden maybe slightly waver. And that, hmm, they're denying what I'm saying, so maybe I'm not going to say that again. Right? Whereas that these were either, according to one opinion, apostles or messengers, is that they reaffirmed it more emphatically because they're people of truth and they've been sent with a mission. And that, inna ilaykum mursalun. And so that this is why that if we believe in truth and we speak that truth and that there is a response from people that is not really the ideal response, and that they are putting into question what it is that we're saying or not accepting what we're saying. And then they become that disparaging and derogatory. Is it, how do we respond? We have to be even further, we have to be even more firm. <laughs> they answered, Our Lord knows that we have indeed been sent unto you. And then, وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ and our duty is only to convey the message clearly. That's all we can do. And every person that is that interested in accepting, living, and conveying truth has to know this. And our duty is only to convey the message clearly. You cannot make someone else do something. You cannot force someone else to believe something. There is no compulsion in religion. Our job is to clarify the truth of things. A, a balag that is mubin, al balag al mubin, to convey the message clearly. If there's questions that people have, we happily answer those questions to the best of our ability. If we can't answer them, we send them to someone else who can answer them. Is that we do our very best to express the truth that we believe in to other people and that we clarify our principles to other people and then people will have different responses. People will have different responses. This is just the way things are. This is the Sunnah of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the earth. But once you realize that, it gives you the internal solace because sometimes that we get weak because people don't accept what it is that we say. And somehow we think that because people are not accepting something we say, it means that what we say is actually not true. So we start to question ourselves in this type of thing. Whereas no. Is that when you believe in truth, you have to be firm in that belief. And that we have to realize that not everyone is going to accept what it is that you believe. And that this is there to make us that have that firmness that we need and to recognize our whole purpose is just to clarify. Just to clarify in a clear fashion and then the rest is up to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we incorporate these principles into our lives is that you will find, we will find much, much, much good that comes from it and our interactions with people will be very different and that uh, we should think a lot about people because as it has been said, only people have that destroyed other people. One of the biggest veils for most people are other people. And wanting approval from other people, wanting to be like other people, having expectations in other people. And that ideally is that we don't want to have any expectations in any human being. Is that we only want to have our hope be in our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then based upon the prophetic teachings that we interact with all other people that are around us in a way that is principled. And sometimes that means being gentle, and that's usually the case. And other times, which is a little bit more rare, <coughs> it means that we are firm in putting everything in its proper place. Because indeed, sometimes when we have, sometimes having good character means is that you are firm. And so we put everything in its proper place, and then ultimately we leave the creation to the Creator. We leave the creation to the Creator and we are first and foremost only required to save our own selves and to work upon our own selves and then because we've been commanded to do so is that as many other people that we can help we try to do so 
But all of that, the whole purpose of it is, is ta'abudan. It's to establish our servitude to Allah because He wants us to do it. And so our love of good for people in all of the manifestations of the love of that good is ultimately because this is what is pleasing to our Lord. So we live and die upon that and even our worst enemies that have caused us personal harm to a degree that we can't possibly imagine is that we are worshipping Allah by that wanting good for that particular person. And when you have hearts that embrace these meanings as that it won't be a short time won't pass in any particular geographic location except that usually what happens is that people are guided to that truth because of the great hearts of these people who that embody these lofty principles. May Allah wa ta'ala that uh, root these principles in our hearts and may Allah ta'ala bless us to benefit from these ayat and barakat to give us tawfiq in all of our different prayers and learn to take lessons from the situations that are happening around us from that our own lives and from people that are around us so that we won't be the lesson for the people in the future. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. There's any uh, quick questions? I have one. Um, how does hypocrisy come into play here? Like if uh, somebody opposes the truth in front of you with a statement or an action, and then a person doesn't stand up for the truth. Could this be a sign of hypocrisy? Like if, if, if the person, if, if, if someone's opposing the truth and someone doesn't stand up to that person's truth. It might, it might not necessarily be hypocrisy because people have different personalities too, right? Mm -hmm. So some people are are able to be stronger than others and that some people from certain backgrounds find it very easy to be very firm upon the truth. Other people, they believe in it, but their interactions with people, uh, they have a personality that is, there's a weakness to it. Mm -hmm. And so there's no doubt that's a deficiency. And then they have to go about that treating that deficiency in themselves. Um, so it's not necessarily, if I think about it in that way, uh, hypocrisy. Um, it, it could be if someone was just kind of just glossing over it and that really not that saying anything when they had the ability to do so, or right, out of hypocrisy. But it, it, in my mind, it doesn't have to necessarily be hypocrisy. It could just be like a, a, a weakness in someone's personality or something like that. Sheikh, you mentioned ittiham, uh, ittiraq, and what was the third one? So the first was, um, the first was um, that, um,